There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the causes for laziness and for diligence, or what he calls aroused persistence or aroused energy. He gives eight examples, and in each case the reason for being lazy or for being diligent or energetic has nothing to do with outside circumstances, has everything to do with your attitude. If you don't get enough to eat, the lazy person says, Oh, I didn't get enough to eat today. I won't have any strength. I can't practice. The diligent person says, Well, when the body hasn't eaten so much, it's a lot lighter, less likely to fall asleep. Good opportunity to practice. Or if you're recovering from an illness, the lazy person says, Oh, I'm still not strong enough yet. I better not practice. The diligent person says, I'm stronger than I was, and I don't know if I'm going to have a relapse. Here's an opportunity to practice. And the way it's presented, it's comical. In other words, it's totally arbitrary whether you're going to take a particular incident as a reason to be lazy or a reason to be diligent. And it's easy for us to see the humor in these situations. Now, when it comes to feelings, especially mental feelings, the Buddha makes pretty much the same observation. Things can be going bad, and you can either take that as a reason for feeling grief, or you can think about it in a way that gives rise to joy or equanimity. And although we can laugh at the, the monks who are lazy or diligent, especially at the monks who are lazy, it's hard to laugh in the case of your feelings. We tend to identify with them really strongly. There's something very real about a feeling. And in this modern world of ours where there's so many ideas floating around that we really don't know whose ideas to take, even the own ideas swimming around in our mind, we're a little bit leery of them as to where they came from. But our feelings seem to be really ours. And so we hold on to them, even in cases where they're blatantly causing us suffering. So you can ask yourself, do you want to continue holding on, or would you like to find the opportunity for some freedom? In other words, realizing that your feelings are fabricated. This is one of the reasons why right view comes at the beginning of the path, because as the Buddha notes, we suffer around our feelings as one of the five clinging aggregates. And each of those aggregates is something that's fabricated. We put them together. And if we put them together in an unskillful way, we have to realize it doesn't have to continue with be being that way. We can change our habits. We can learn how to put them together in a more skillful way. For instance, when things aren't going well, someone has died, you've suffered loss of one sort or another. As the Buddha said, you can feel what he calls householder grief. Simply thinking, I'm not getting what I wanted. This really hurts me. I feel lost, whatever. Or you can reflect on the fact, well, these things are in constant. How could you expect that there was going to be a permanent happiness out of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations? Which are the ways through which we know one another, the ways through which we experience the world? Then you reflect on the fact that there are people who've gone beyond their attachment to these things. This gives rise to what the Buddha calls renunciation, grief. The desire, oh, when will I have that freedom as, as well? And this, he says, is better than householder grief. Because householder grief, usually if you simply follow it, you end up looking for householder joy. Well, when is there going to be a pleasant sight or sound taste? When can I find another relationship? When can I find 
something that will replace the loss. Of course, that leads you to looking for happiness and things that are going to leave you again. And John Ford once made the observation that when there's a sensual pleasure that we really aspire toward, it's a sign that we had it in the past and we miss it. Whether the past here is the past in this lifetime or a previous lifetime. He says, think about for that. He said, think about this for a minute and give rise to a sense of dismay, because you just keep going back for the same things and you finally get them, and then you're going to lose them again, and then you're going to miss them again, and then you're going to struggle to get them again and again and again. There's no end to that. And that's really depressing. Whereas there's a way out, if you find a joy that comes from letting go, from developing the path. That gives rise to a happiness and well-being that does not waver in any way at all. And so even though you may not have achieved that goal yet, and it may bother you that you haven't achieved it, that sense of being bothered is a lot better than just allowing yourself to wallow in the grief of things that you've lost. So what this comes down to is learning how to think about things in a different way. And where you're going to get the strength to do that, this is why we work with breath meditation. and give rise to a sense of strength in the body by the way we focus on the breath energy. A sense of well-being in the body that comes from the way we focus on the breath. Because that is one of the elements that enables you to step back and look at your mind, and the thoughts going on in your mind, and realize that you have the choice. You can go with the things that cause you to suffer, or you can go some in another direction. And if you can't think of what that other direction might be, you can read about what people in the past have done and train their minds to think in new ways. It's a case of the woman who lost her daughter and she was mourning in the cemetery. And the Buddha came past and said, Do you realize you've lost 84,000 daughters all buried in the cemetery? And she said just thinking about that changed her attitude entirely, allowed her to let go of her grief. So this is part of dealing with these feelings as they come up. When we read about feelings as a frame of reference, we tend to think of it simply as watching things as they come and go, and it seems to be pretty random. What's going to come and what's going to go, and you just sit there with a the randomness. But you have to remember that in developing mindfulness, one of the factors is ardency, and ardency means trying to be skillful in how you deal with these things. As the Buddha points out, there's skillful joy and unskillful joy, skillful grief and unskillful grief, skillful equanimity and unskillful equanimity. And we have a tendency to cultivate these things. We don't think about it sometimes consciously, but we do tend to cultivate certain types of grief or certain types of joy, certain types of equanimity, because we like them. And it may turn out that the things we like may be skillful, but that's not necessarily the case. This is where you have to see, what does this do to the mind if I think in these ways, if I cultivate these particular emotions? For instance, with joy, we tend to think joy is a good thing regardless. Well, not necessarily. Certain types of joy are really harmful for the mind because they depend on your doing unskillful things in order to maintain the causes of that joy. And they can get you very weak if you need to have things in a particular way in order to be happy. You get very unreliable. People can prey on your fears. And this is a lot of what politics is all about. They want to make you afraid so they can make you do what they want. Whereas if you learn how to develop a joy that comes from how you breathe, how you focus the mind, how you develop qualities of mindfulness, ardency, alertness, concentration, discernment. What the Buddha calls joy or pleasure, not of the flesh, rapture, not of the flesh. It's based on concentration. That kind of joy actually strengthens the mind. And 
It's a joy that's not touched by events outside or puts you in a position where you can look at events outside and think about them in a new way. So that regardless of how well or poorly things are going, you can have an inner sense of well-being. So remember, we're going around cultivating feelings all the time, so we might as well cultivate good ones. And remember that they're fabricated, which means it's not that you're not being true to your deeper nature when you try to change a particular feeling. You're just learning new habits. Again, this is where the qualities we develop through breath meditation help. You become more mindful, you become more alert, less attached to the, the views expressed in your mind, the views that go into making a feeling. Sometimes there's a belief that there's the feeling that comes first and then the thoughts develop around it, but that's not necessarily the case. A lot of your thinking can give rise to feelings too. So it's good to be able to step back from them, watch them from the point of view of the breath. Notice how the breath tightens up around certain feelings. Notice how you can breathe through them. This allows you to separate yourself out from them from a bit, and then ask yourself, okay, is this a particularly skillful or unskillful kind of feeling here? Is this something I want to cultivate or something I want to abandon? And reflect on the tools that we have to dismantle unskillful feelings and build skillful ones in their place. Because this is what is involved in taking feelings as a frame of reference. It has to be done with right view, the view that reminds you that these things are fabricated. And if a particular feeling seems natural, it's simply a matter that's habitual. You have habitual ways of thinking, habitual ways of indulging in a particular feeling. Which doesn't mean that it's truly you, it's simply that this is a habit that's taken over. Of course, nobody's forcing you to get out of those feelings. Simply the Buddha's offering you the opportunity that you can get out. These are the tools. When you've suffered a loss, there's a certain extent to which expressing grief is appropriate. It's the case of King Vasenity, who learned that Queen Malika, his favorite queen, had died. He was in the midst of a conversation with the Buddha when one of his aides came up and whispered this in his ear. He broke down and cried. And the Buddha said, when did you ever think that something that is born could last forever? It sounds a little harsh. But then he went on to say, as long as you see that eulogies Remembrances are serving a purpose, and they do have their purpose. Go ahead and engage in them. In other words, give expression to your grief when you feel that it's serving a good purpose. But then when you realize that it's simply getting indulgent, you're getting deeper and deeper into an unskillful state of mind. That's when you realize, okay, you've got to get beyond this. You've got to learn how to think in new ways. That King Basanity had the problem, he wasn't much of a meditator. But here we are meditating. We're learning the skills. How to deal with the breath, how to deal with the body, how to deal with the events in the mind. So you can step back from them a bit and watch them. And realize that you have the tools to remake them when they're unskillful. And the role of mind mindfulness is to remember that, to keep that in mind. So that whatever comes up, you don't forget that you've got the tools that can help prevent you from suffering. This is one of the Buddha's greatest gifts. <laughs>